So next up is Tom Simpson, who's going to be looking at the Inside Explorer table. And Tom has a video. It's the one on uh, YouTube. Which I have not queued up. It's, it's in the your minimized. Uh-huh. Or on Chrome. There we go. OK, Tom Simpson. Thanks very much. While I'm just maximizing this, I say I work in the Nature Live department, and um, I also run the museum cricket team and write the match reports. And for everyone from Q, we're very much looking forward to the rematch on the 5th. Hopefully, you will fare better than in previous years. I'm going to start with this video. It's got no sound. Uh, well, that's not the right video. OK, I'm not going to start with the video. I'm just going to talk about the Inside Explorer table. And I'm going to do that with the Inside Explorer table over here. If we could bring it up as the slave screen. It was the other tab. OK. Um, I'll have a go at that then. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So the Inside Explorer table, it comes from, um, comes from Sweden at a place called the Interactive Institute. And it allows uh, users to manipulate CT and MRI data. And the reason this isn't an app, but is on a rather large screen with a big computer, is that they're actually working with the data. It's not a, rep well, it's a representation, but they are using all the data that anyone looking at the CT scan from a scientific um, point of view would do as well. And I think that's the power of it, that actually, when the public uses this, they're using it in a very similar way to how scientists would use CT data. You're allowed to manipulate specimens in all sorts of ways. It works just like a touch screen. So anyone who's ever used a smartphone or a tablet PC will know how to use it. And we're lucky enough to have two here in the museum. We have the one in front of me, which is a roving table. It can go anywhere in the museum that has a lift. You can book it by emailing me. You can use it for conferences. You can use it in the galleries. You can use it however you like. And we're really keen to get your input on how we can use it in the future. Hopefully behind me, you'll see how it's used with, with visitors. It's really an absolutely incredible piece of kit, and we're super excited to have it. And everywhere we've used it, people have absolutely loved it. If we could get the slave screen up for a second. Aside from the roving table, the second table is going to go at the end of the Darwin Centre cocoon conclusion area. And uh, it's going to be fixed in place, so it won't be allowed to be moved around. But it will have the same data that the roving one has. OK, so I'm going to get going. This doesn't look very promising, does it? Um, it did you have the slave screen set up, Chris? OK, do you want to try with the camera up there, then, so at least people can see the... OK, so this is going to be rather pixelated because of the camera up there, but maybe afterwards at lunch you can come and have a play, and I'll show you a little bit how it works. I'm going to start with a human. Have we got the camera up, Chris? Hmm. It's a bit worrying. OK, fantastic. So it looks much better when you're looking at it from here. I can absolutely promise you that, but you'll have to take my word for it. This is how it started with virtual autopsy, and I can show you a little bit how it works. It really is very, very straightforward. It takes a little bit of time to load up when it's first booted, but you're allowed to manipulate the data exactly as you would imagine. You, you maximize and minimize by dragging in and dragging out. You can rotate the, the images, and you can also make incisions when the scissors appear. So if I cut in here, I could reveal, for example, the face of the person in this virtual autopsy table. And what's wonderful about it is that there are these transfer functions on the bottom that allow you to look inside. So we set these however we see fit. So for example, I could highlight the skeletons, skeleton rather, of this person. And in this case, this was designed as a tool that people visiting the museum would be able to look for cause of death within this person. This is a traffic victim from 2000. But you can also, once you've made incisions, add back on layers. So you can see the placement of the different parts of the anatomy. And when you see, especially young people, using this table, it's just so exciting because they're feeling their own body and then they're looking inside it. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful to, to experience in the gallery. Obviously, there are much more important and interesting things than humans on the planet. So we can have a look at some of those. These are all museum specimens that have gone through uh, the CT unit downstairs. I'm going to have a little look at Tissant, because last year at Science Uncovered, we had a, a magical interaction where Caroline Smith had a piece of Tissant and was then talking to visitors about how they find about, out about the, where the meteorite came from and also about the atmosphere on Mars by looking for inclusions. And the amazing thing about CT is that you can see what's not there as well. So if I go on Air Pockets, it will allow me to see inside it. And we can put these data points on so that we can explain what people are looking at. And this is just text, but there's no reason in the future why this couldn't be a video that pops up on the side, and maybe Caroline could be explaining exactly what she's looking at. As well as things that are from the natural world, we were lucky enough to have some Blaschkas. And this was really, really exciting for us as well. I showed this to Giles Miller, and he um, was involved in the scanning of this. And the first thing he looked for, is Giles here, by the way? 
okay, so I can probably get this wrong and he wouldn't mind that much, um, is he wanted to look at how the, the structure was bound in the middle. And by removing the outer structure, and he then made it bigger, and once he learned to use it, he cut in. You can see up here, and you can't see it that well on the screen, but you'll have to take my word for it and come and have a look, that there's a, there's a whipping of the glass as it's bound around this central structure. And he was just fascinated about that. And I thought it was amazing that he'd use this to find that out. He knew that from the CT data he'd seen when he'd done the scan. But when he did that in front of me, I didn't just take his word for it. I'd seen the exact thought process that he'd gone through as well. And I have one final, very small video to show you of Russell Garwood. We did a Nature Live last, the week before last, in fact. Uh, do you know where it is, Vince, in, in the folder? Yeah, it's in the folder. Oh, there we go. OK. So we'll start from about halfway. Yeah, I'll mute it. And, and um, Russell here is talking about a fossil arachnid. We have it on the table as well. And again, he was going through the exact same process that he went through when he saw this data in the first place. And so he wasn't just saying, I CT scanned this specimen, and now I understand a little bit more about perhaps how it fed. In this case, he was talking about that he thought it was a predator because of the position of the arms. He was showing people exactly that process. And the enthusiasm that Russell has, he, you can see he's going on a bit now, just spinning it around. Maybe I'll fast forward Russell until I can see. As he removed the layers, he's showing people exactly what his thought process was. And that enthusiasm was so infectious, at the end, everyone rushed down. Anyone who's done a nature live or knows about them will know that actually that's one of the best parts of it when people come down at the end. And they were doing these exact same manipulations as he was. And that, for me, is the absolute power of the table. Fantastic. I'm going to stop that there. And just to finish, I'm going to explain the process of how things get from the table, or rather on the table, from the CT unit. They scan, well, they do around 2,000 scans a year downstairs. And there's no reason why any number of those couldn't appear on the table. But at the moment, that data has to go to Sweden and then back again. And I think everyone's, well, everyone who's involved in this project has the dream that perhaps there's a way that we can do it just like that, keep it all in-house. And then whenever you get a new specimen that you're excited about and it's been CT scanned, we can get it on the table as soon as possible, get the press in, get the public in, and they can explore it inside. That's it. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that was absolutely fantastic. I think it's really extraordinary the kind of visualizations that we can get from this. And hopefully, if we can provide that sort of pipeline from our own CT scanning to this, I think we can get a lot more people engaged in that.